morning. It is 11.35 on Friday, April 12th, and I'm calling the Rules and Administration uh, Subcommittee. This is a subcommittee on joint and permanent, permanent rules uh, to order. Uh, today we're going to be discussing a proposal that is uh, the result of the work of many people. Um, and it is a pro proposal for our consideration that when we move this, it would go next to the Rules Committee and it would be deliberated there, and when uh, finished there, it would move to the floor for a discussion. Um, we uh, took this up this year uh, for many reasons, including um, Senator Dreskowski's uh, reminder uh, that we were operating under temporary rules and that we had the opportunity to refresh our rules, but I, I, I wanna thank, before we get started here, really everybody, right? I wanna thank Secretary Bodron, um, and Council Stango uh, for their work. I want to thank the staff from both of our caucuses um, and the members here uh, who have been working um, to bring uh, what we have before us, before us um, which is what I believe is the beginning of a consolidated approach to uh, permanent rules that we would bring to the floor. And I know there's still going to be some debate, and I know that there is not complete support for all of these proposals. I also want to say, uh, building on what uh, staff brought to us, and particularly Sec Secretary Bodron, in terms of modernizing, and harmonizing, and making clear our rules, uh, that we are uh, working uh, to achieve what uh, will support the continued work of the Minnesota Senate. Mm -hmm. There were a number of proposals that came forward from members from both caucuses, um, some that were more substantive changes that aren't included here. Um, things like uh, negotiated time limits, uh, pre-filing, um, and other items that came forward that have been considered but aren't included. Those could still be subject of debate or discussion, depending on members, uh, but I wanted to make sure that uh, I was giving voice to the fact that there have been a number of participants here and what we have before us, I think, is a set of policies uh, that will serve the institution uh, and we'll be now debated here in rules and on the floor before they become our permanent rules. Are there any questions about that process? All right. Um, so what I would like to do, we have a couple of things. I'd like to begin with uh, the draft uh, temporary, the draft permanent rules, which is SR 029-16. And so uh, Senator Pappas moves uh, the adoption of SR 02916 uh, so that we have that document before us. Um, Thank you, Senator Pappas. Um, if it is okay with the committee, what I'd like to do is turn to uh, Council Stangle and have her do a high-level overview of what we have before us. Ms. Stangle. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'll go through this rather quickly um, and highlight the proposals and where they came from, uh, rule by rule. I will not talk about the technical changes that are made. And when I talk about technical changes, what I mean is things like changing shell to must and changing group to caucus, capitalization changes, grammatical changes, and things like that. So I'll be skipping over all of those changes. Um, so starting with rule one, um, and when I talk about um, the Murphy proposal, that's SR 029-5, that was a proposal brought to the subcommittee last time by Secretary Bodern, um, referred to here in the summary as the Murphy proposal. So the changes in rule one relate to referring to the most recent version of Mason's manual, that was from the Senator Murphy proposal. The change in rule three strikes language uh, that is obsolete related to bill introductions in the interim, also from the Murphy proposal. And rule four was a Senator Draskowski proposal requiring bills proposing constitutional amendments to go to the Rules Committee. Rule five change was from the Murphy proposal clarifying the process for recalling bills from committee and the number of votes that takes. Rule six clarifies that uh, when the rule applies, um, specifically relating to when the Rules Committee is established or the adoption of temporary rules, again, that was from the Murphy proposal. The change to Rule 7 came from a Senator Marty proposal, and this relate, uh, reorganizes the rule relating to budget targets. Uh, rule 10 
change comes from the Murphy proposal, striking language related to uniform criteria governing committee assignments. The changes to Rule 12 come from a variety of proposals from Murphy, Marty, Bolden, and two Senator Pratt proposals, as well as um, some additional changes. And you'll see that the Rule 12 looks a little bit different. When all of the changes were put together, uh, Rule 12.1 was really long and difficult to read. So you'll see that it is now reorganized into three paragraphs. The first paragraph relates to meetings in general. The second paragraph relates to member participation in meetings. And the third paragraph relates to witness participation in meetings. So this, uh, par this rule does, has a variety of changes. Uh, it strikes references to the certain county delegations being open to the public. It requires committee and subcommittee hearings to be held in a manner that uh, permits remote participation. It requires witnesses to be seen and heard by committee members when pro providing testimony. Strikes all references to the COVID-19 health pandemic. It allows participation from members with caucus leader approval. And it removes all of the other um, language about remote participation um, in other situations, previously, uh, remote participation was allowed without caucus leader approval in some instances like special sessions, and that has been removed. It specifies that members participating remotely must be visible when speaking or voting. It allows members participating remotely to be counted in a division. It requires witnesses to be allowed to testify remotely in committees where testimony is taken. It changes the term internet connection to technology connection. It strikes a requirement to post notices on Senate bulletin boards and sending notices to the House and in leaves in place the requirement to post everything on the Senate website. It specifies that hearing notices sent on a listserv constitutes notice to proponents and opponents. It changes the process for meeting past midnight so a committee may extend the meeting for only one hour past midnight by a vote of two thirds of all members of the committee and not just those present. It updates the language and requires minutes to be taken and reflect all actions and votes taken. And it, it adds new languages that new language that prohibits disturbances and disorderly conducts during committee hearings and it states that the chair is responsible for order and decorum. And it allows the committee chair to establish written procedures for conducting a committee hearing. In rule 13, there's a change from the Murphy proposal um, related to adjournment if no date is set and requires the adjournment to be, to the reconvening to happen on the next calendar day, excluding Sunday. And Rule 14 from the Murphy proposal deletes redundant language and specifies that a tie vote on appeal from decision of the president sustains the vote of the president. The change in Rule 15 comes from a Senator Draskowski proposal uh, that is modified slightly, and the change here requires personal admission for everybody to the Senate chamber except for senators, um, officers of the Senate, members of the House of Representatives, and Senate staff. So the change here is that um, under the Senator Draskowski proposal, House members would have to be personally admitted in the proposal before you today. House members do not require personal admission. Uh, the changes to Rule 17 are from a Senator Rest proposal. This require uh, moves the demonstration prohibition to its own rule and allows senators and staff to consume water on the floor uh, regardless of how long the proceedings are to be last will last and make some other changes to the water language as well rule 18 makes some conforming changes to the rules that are being stricken later um, from the murphy proposal rule 19 is also from the Murphy proposal and requires the Secretary of the Senate to ensure all messages are promptly delivered in the chamber. This corresponds to a deletion of that responsibility from the Sergeant at Arms later in the proposal. Rule 20 is from the Murphy proposal and allows messages from the House to be made available electronically instead of being in print. Rule 22 makes a conforming change and then states that general orders does remain and will be a list of bills that have received a second reading. That's from the Murphy proposal. Rules 23, 24, and 25 related to committee of the whole, the calendar and the consent calendar are all stricken and that's from the Murphy proposal. Rule 26 is a conforming change from the Murphy proposal. Rule 28 adds a cross-reference to Rule 29, and Rule 29 specifies that a motion to adjourn sine die is subject to debate, amendment, and subsidiary motions, and that's from the Murphy proposal. 
Rule 32 is also from the Murphy proposal and is a conforming change. Rule 33 has two pieces to it, one from the Murphy proposal, which is a conforming change, and one from a Draskowski proposal that specifies that an amendment to an amendment may be amended once that underlying amendment has been adopted. Rule 35 is from the Murphy proposal, makes a conforming change, it, and then specifies uh, what question the president must put to the body when asking about germaneness. Rule 37 is from the Murphy proposal and strikes obsolete language about officers being absent from the session. Rule 39 is from the Murphy proposal and some new language. Uh, this is all about division of a question and it requires member calling for the division to state the proposed division, requires the president to determine if the division is possible and then specifies that the author determine which portion to vote on first. And it also strikes obsolete language uh, relating to a motion to strike. Rule 40 comes from a Murphy proposal, REST proposal, and a Marty proposal. It strikes references related to COVID-19, allows a member to vote remotely during a floor session to be counted in division, requires a record in the journal when a member votes remotely, and strikes a prohibition on accepting per diem when a member votes remotely on the floor. Rule 41 and 42 make conforming changes, and that's from the Murphy proposal. Rule 44 is also from the Murphy proposal. Strikes requirement that bills be engrossed before are transmitted to the House, uh, specifies that the engrossing and rolling is done under the authority of the secretary and the engrossing secretary, and then moves language from a later rule into this rule related to the engrossing secretary's responsibilities. Rule 45 makes a conforming change, and that's from the Murphy proposal. Rule 46 reorganizes the selection for conference committee, and this is a new proposal. Um, and what this does is instead of requiring um, committee, conference committee members to have it voted yes for the conference committee, uh, it puts it into a list of factors that must be considered in the appointment. And from the Murphy proposal, it specifies that the subcommittee and conference committee isn't subject to the committee meeting requirements in Rule 12. Rule 47 is from the Murphy proposal and strikes some obsolete language and makes a conforming change. Rule 48 is also from the Murphy proposal and makes a conforming change and uh, talks about making things electronically available. Rule 50 makes a conforming change from the Murphy proposal. Rule 51 is from the Murphy proposal and a new proposal. And here you'll see that strikes language related to duties of the engrossing secretary that were moved earlier removes obsolete language related to long distance telephone calls. That's the new proposal and reorders the month in chronological order. Rule 52 is from the Murphy proposal and it deletes the language about Secretary of State's delivering message, Secretary, sorry, Sergeant at Arms delivering messages um, that was moved to the Secretary earlier and strikes um, obsolete languages and updates it with current language. Rule 54 is from the Murphy proposal, uh, striking language um, regarding committee members requesting action of the rules committee be submitted as a resolution strikes notice requirements, posting notice in public spaces, and reference strikes references to the Rules Committee's full and exclusive authority over employment matters. Rule 55 is a Senator Champion proposal about the Subcommittee on Ethical Conduct, and there was one, uh, two changes to that, one technical change where two, the order of two sentences was flip-flopped, and uh, the other change was within the 30-day proposal before a complaint is dismissed after deadlock, uh, the president, or the, the chair of the subcommittee is required to hold a, an additional hearing for further action if three members of the subcommittee request a hearing. Uh, in Rule 56, there are two changes. One is a new proposal, um, and the change there is that it now, that, that rule talks about potential conflicts of interest and cross-reference to statute. The new proposal is that it inserts the statutory language into the rule, so you can see what the statute says instead of just seeing a cross-reference. And there's a modified version of a Senator Pratt proposal um, th that now states that Senate equipment and resources are for purposes of the Senate and the legislature and that they must not be used for commercial purposes or campaign activity. And then the Rule 57 is a new rule that comes from the Senator Draskowski proposal um, inserting the language from a statute about uh, prohibiting accepting employment or receiving compensation for services performed from businesses related to lobbying, and that rule is um, enforced by a complaint to the Subcommittee on Ethical Conduct.
Thank you, Ms. Stengel. Senator Pappas. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. In terms of Rule um, 51-4, I actually was here, as was some of us, um, when I think a lot of members and staff thought our long distance calls were free. So there was, there was a misunderstanding, and we found out that you know, the Senate was actually being charged for that. So what's the situation right now? I mean, everyone has their cell phone where they can call long distance typically, but if someone uses their Senate phone, is there a charge for long distance calls or is there kind of a flat rate for all our telephones? Uh, Ms. Stengel. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Pappas, it's my understanding that we don't have long distance charges now. I think we use VoIP or something right. similar to that. VoIP, okay. Um, Senator Pappas. On a different topic, unless the rest is on this topic. Okay, um, Madam Chair, then I wanted to know the situation with the um, remote voting per diem. Is that retroactive to the beginning of session or just once the rule, rule changes are passed? Thank you, uh, Senator Pappas, for the question. Uh, Senator Rust has raised that as well, but it is not anything that I've engaged in any conversation with. Um, and I think it would be, you know, certainly something we can discuss as a sub subcommittee, but it is not um, a part of the rules that we would be passing, as I understand. Ms. Stengel, oh, anything thought, more on that? I thought it's in here. Um, thank you, um, Madam Chair and Senator Pappas. The language is in here, but there is no effective date, and typically there isn't an effective date on a resolution, so that's something that would need to be instructed. Um, typically, as you know, things aren't effective retroactively, so there would need to be some guidance given to fiscal services on when this would happen. Um, so they would know how to process this. So that's something that would need to be given direction by the subcommittee, the committee, and then the Senate. So, so Madam Chair, that's still under consideration. Um, thank you, Senator Pappas, as you are raising it, and as Senator Rest raised it yesterday, it can be something that we can consider. We just have to work our way through the process. I have Senator Rest, and then Senator Draskowski, and then Senator Dibble. Senator Rest, can I just ask, is your mic on? Thank you, Senator Sorry. Rest. Um, I'm not going to repeat all that, but <laughs> anyway, 33.6, um, 33 what's in here now is an amendment to an amendment may be amended once adopted. And um, we went round and round, round and about, um, <clears throat> Uh, really finding out where the first degree, second degree, and third degree amendments uh, may be made and looked at Mason's and um, <clears throat> that it, it would be, uh, and wasn't clear what once adopted um, modified, whether it modified the word amended or something else. And if we change and move once adopted um, after to after the second amendment word, it, it, it does become clear. So an amendment to an amendment, once adopted, uh, may be amended. And that, that will give um, really clear direction to the, um, the president, and it is consistent with, um, with, um, uh, with uh, uh, Masons, and also, I, I don't know whether it was Senator Draskowski or Pratt, 
it's also consistent with Robert's rules of order that we don't follow, but um, but certainly is good parliamentary uh, procedure. So at whatever time is appropriate to uh, uh, consider um, amendments or changes, I, w I would like to be called on to, um, to do that. And if it is, uh if it pleases the committee, what I'd like to do is get through our questions and then come back to amendments. I know okay. there are a couple, so if that's, if that's acceptable. Then I have an, another. Senator Rest. Um, we also discussed um, what happens, uh, and we do have kind of um, um, uh, custom and usage of, that's clarified here about when someone makes a request for a division of um, of an amendment, and that it is the president's decision uh, to determine if, if if that division is possible, and then it is the author, um, <clears throat> um, the, the author of the amendment, who determines which por portion to vote on first. But it occurred to me, as um, Ms. Stangle was uh, referring to Rule Thirty Nine. Every single rule here is subject to um, um, a point of order. So, um, and maybe this has never happened, but what happened, but the question is, if the president says this amendment is not divisible and somebody, a member, stands up and says, um, I... Um, uh, I object to the ruling on the chair, et cetera. Um, has that ever happened um, so that, that, that this is somehow um, uh, a question? I don't recall it ever happening, but um, we've had points of order raised on very minor issues. Uh, in, in at least the last six years, and um, uh, I would expect that if a point of order is raised about the president's decision that if his point of order is overturned or her point of order is overturned, um, um, we just move forward with it being divisible as raised by the point of order, but might make it extremely awkward <laughs> and and not not common sense. Uh, so just not suggesting changing it, but that it is uh, <clears throat> uh, we may want to at some point be prepared for if a member uh, disagrees and is upheld. The, um, the result may be unintelligible. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Certainly in my four years as Senate President, I don't recall a member no. ever asking for a division when the amendment was not divisible. Um, so I think that, just but I, I have never thought of that before, where it Madam could Chair, happen. Senator yeah. Pappas asked things. Um, occur right. that we should be prepared right. um, seems to me to trust the president mm -hmm. and um, it should be pretty uh, pretty clear on its face mm -hmm. um, but yeah. you never can tell so thank you madam president thank you senator rest senator Dreskowski. thank you madam chair um, I um, Another area, Senator Rest, that uh, could be questionable, the, the president also has to confirm that the author of the bill, when they decide where to divide it, that it is divisible there. That would be the call of the president at that point and then subject to the body's, you know, overturning. So I, I think that kind of falls into the same, same thing. thing. We, we can't, we, we can't go into all of the eventualities, but... Um, certainly there's a process there to make sure that that gets ironed out. Um, I, I, the, the question I have, Madam Chair, I didn't completely follow the discussion you and Senator Pappas were having about um, uh, 
uh, line 22.1 in the bill, the elimination of the per diem for um, people voting remotely during floor sessions. I didn't follow the discussion. I don't know if I wasn't listening closely or what, but can you tell us again where we are there? Thanks, uh, Senator Jaskowski, and I will do my best to summarize what I understand is being raised uh, and allow others who are raising it to share their perspective. But uh, as this work has uh, continued, um, the question about the effective date of the rules that we're putting in place in general and then whether or not there would be any retroactivity tied to per diem if we strip the relationship between per diem and remote voting. So if we, if we separate those two um, in our rules, then the question was raised, would there be retroactive consideration for per diem uh, to the start of the session? That, that is the question that has come to me. Um, I have not wrestled with that question. I, because it's coming up, I think we should wrestle with it. I'm not sure we should do it here. Um, in this forum, we can. Um, but I, I think it is a question. It's a mechanical question. It would be something we would need to decide, perhaps, in the Rules Committee. Um, but uh, because it has come here to this forum, um, and Senator Pappas has raised it here, um, I, I wanted to make sure to recognize that I'm hearing it. Um, and that it is a question that we should answer. Uh, and that's about as far as I've gotten. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. That was much clearer. Thank you. You're well, welcome. And Sen Madam Chair, I think Senator it also Pappas. involved when the rules go into effect, then does that go into effect as well? Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, had a few questions. Um, they don't necessarily need answers, um, but just for consideration. Um, the first question I had was on remote voting. I'll call members' attention to line 8.1, which is a part of Rule 12. It says, with the approval of the respective caucus leader, members may participate and vote remotely, et cetera. Um, and I'm curious to know um, uh, why um, there might be a difference in members' rights uh, to, to participate and vote remotely um, based on the prerogative of their respective caucus leader. So that's just a question, um, which we don't need to necessarily answer now, um, but I wanted to put that out there. Um, I think Senator Rest might have wanted to respond to this point. I see the hand. All right, Senator. Rest. I, <laughs> uh, thank you, um, Senator uh, Dibble. It's current practice. Um, we have, uh, <clears throat> even when remote voting started, the um, uh, Republican caucus um, leader uh, instructed uh, uh, their members the conditions under which um, remote voting would be permitted. And the DFL caucus leader did the same, and and that we shouldn't impose um, uh, a different, you know, the same set of rules for uh, the two different bodies, and to leave that to the caucus leader. And since that was the current practice, it seems to have worked pretty well, without complaints internally from each caucus to their leader, that it um, it would work in the in the um, uh, in the rules as well, and I, th I think we get into um, uh, unnecessary tension by telling the Republicans they have to abide by the rules that are set by the majority leader, and the same way um, the other that the uh, Democrats may not want to um, uh, do not agree with the the, the uh, requirements that would be set by the uh, by the Republican leader, it's, and it's a uh, respect for the uh, integrity and an autonomy for each caucus, assuming that um, the rules or the procedures or the protocols um, are not going to be um, uh, um, objectionable, certainly uh, in general. Thank you. Um, 
Senator Dibble. So I'll just say I, um, I understand that that is current practice. I think, um, I think that is not well advised. I think it is of sufficient importance in terms of everyone uh, who is you know, a duly elected representative. Um, I think this reaches beyond partisan difference and caucus prerogative. I think this is important enough that everyone should be treated um, the same and, and uh, there should, I mean, this is a fundamental difference in how people are participating in the debate and the discussion as elected representatives of their district. So I would just uh, disagree with that. So I'll just put that out there for the moment and I might have a motion later. Um, can I ask just another on couple? Of, yes. Uh, uh, Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Madam Chair, on that topic. Um, does that, I'm just looking quickly in the rules, is that the same for floor votes? that the remote voting um, upon a particular caucus leader. Ms. Dangle is just is checking the language. Go ahead, Ms. Dangle. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Pappas. Yes, if you look at page 21 on lines 21.23, it says, with approval of the respective caucus leader, a member may vote on a question from a location outside the Senate chamber. So, yes. Those are four votes. And just, um, just so we're having a complete conversation, um, if we look at um, page 7, um, 7.11, the deleted section of committee meetings, there is language here as well about approval of respective caucus leaders um, subject to the rule. Um, and so I think it is a fair topic of discussion, and we are having a subcommittee meeting, um, which is also a little bit of a discussion here, which is fine. Um, but I appreciate you raising it, Senator Dibble, and you know, just for your consideration as you were thinking that through and thinking through an amendment where, you know, that's what this process is for. Hmm. Um, so I just want to say that's been our practice apparently in the past with some rules to back that up. And hmm. we're considering this now to see if we're in keeping with the work we want to do going forward. Thank you. Just another couple of quick ones here. Um, Forgive me, um, I did read these beforehand, but then as Ms. Stengel was going through them and then she, she said something that I thought I heard and might have misheard, so if I could just, and then I was scrambling trying to find if I heard that right or not, so I'll just ask. Um, did I hear something about a change to how we either send or receive messages to or from the house? So that would only be in electronic format? Ms. Stengel. Senator Dibble. Yes and no. Okay. Um, the, we Right now, we make things available electronically, and the rules sort of allow for that. But what we do now in the rules is specifically say that things can be made available electronically instead of in paper format. So we're sort of conforming to practice. Um, is that maybe what, you, what you're thinking of? So it specifically says that things may be made available electronically before they are voted on. Another change is, um, there's another change in here about things being engrossed before being sent to the house. That's another thing where we're conforming mm -hmm. our practice, conforming the rules to the practice. Um, so changes to the rules, but not changes to our practice. Senator Dibble. Um, Senator Rest had more. And then Senator Rest and then Senator Pratt. Senator Rest. Well, I was going to say the the other thing is there is, was a previous rule, uh, and this is a suggestion from Secretary Bodder, where the uh, messages to be delivered would be done by the sergeant's office, and that's changed to the um, to the secretary's office. Okay. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for raising this question, Senator Dibble. I hadn't even thought about that, but. You know, there are some of us with amendments or, or certain uh, things that come before the body prefer to have the written versus the uh, electronic. Maybe I'm doing some cross-referencing or something. And so I guess my question for Ms. Stengel is, is it possible that the elect in, in the rule change, and I'm trying to find the rule change along, as Senator Dibble mentioned, and I, if you can remind me what rule we're talking about. Thank you. 
Madam Chair, Ms. Dangle, um, Senator Pratt, one of the rules where we are talking about make, making things electronically is Rule 20. That's on page 14. That's not really, I think, what you're describing, though. This is talking about making things available. Um, so this. So the changes to Rule 20 talk about messages from the House and say things must be printed and placed on the members' desks or made available electronically, so it's not prohibiting things being printed. Um, I think that this is about making sure things can be done efficiently. We could ask some of the people, that we have desk staff here, I'm sure we, you could ask them about what the practice would be. Um, let's see, Senator, I think that there is also a change to Rule Uh, Madam Chair pointed out that there's also a change in Senate uh, in Senate Rule 44. About making um, oh, sorry. Apologies. Senate Rule 48 um, talks about printing things electronically. So a bill must be electronically available or printed when ordered by the Senate. Um, and again, actions by the Senate on a bill that has not been printed or made available electronically is a waiver of that rule. Um, so again, not prohibiting printing of things, but allowing things to be made available electronically um, instead of having things printed. So as you know, currently we don't have everything printed and placed on members' desks automatically, but members do are able to get printed copies of things. Um, so again, I think this is sort of conforming to how we operate, but I'm sure somebody that isn't me could talk about how this would work in practice. Senator Dibble. So I'm not exactly sure I, how I feel about it. Um, I was just wondering if I had heard it correctly, but here's my follow-up question. So I remember we got into a little bit of silliness uh, a few years ago on the bonding bill passed in the closing moments of session and then that was when we had the construction and someone trucked over there and brought the bill and you know thrust it on the under the house desk there's a lot of dispute whether or not it actually was delivered in time or not would this get us away from some of that silliness we can just zap it over there electronically have a time stamp and know what's going on yeah. Secretary Bottern, would you like to join us? I was presiding. Secretary Bottern uh, has been listening carefully, and every so, I see, every so often I see him lean into my line of sight. So I'm glad you're here. Thank you very much. Please uh, introduce yourself and welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Secretary Bottern, um, yes, you're right, I've been listening. The transmittal of messages between the bodies would remain, um, yeah, there's nothing in this proposal that would alter how that occurs, and that's done in paper form in person. Um, really, everything that Ms. Stangle has summarized for you makes it clear that matters can be placed before the Senate electronically. Um, that's really the heart of Rule 48, but that would not alter uh, transmittal of messages between the chambers. All right. And Madam Chair, Senator I'm form a subcommittee to deal with the question that I have. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Although it does seem a little arcane, but I mean that whole exercise seemed a little goofy. But um, all right, thanks. That helps clear it up. Two more quick questions, Madam Chair. Uh, I? If I could ask Senator Pratt to follow oh, up yes, on absolutely. this line. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Dibble, for for uh, allowing me to follow up on on your uh, conversation here. Um, Madam Chair and Mr. Bodern, help me understand the difference between uh, the, the printing and distribution of bills versus the transmittal messages, maybe. Um, um, and, and where transmittal messages would be accommodated for in the rules. Secretary Bodern. Madam Chair and Senator Pratt, you're gonna put me through my paces here. I can describe <laughs> uh, you know, what the practices are. Um, 
So the transmittal of messages between the chambers occurs, for example, when the Senate takes final action on a Senate file. At that point, I would sign the message to the House and a messenger would deliver it uh, to the House chamber. The House is unable to take action on that, uh, that matter until they've received the message and accounted for that properly. Now, where that's located within the rules um, may not be explicit. I'm looking to the team that came with me here. <laughs> or would that be under joint rules? I think you're right, Second. Madam Chair, Senator Pratt. Yeah, I think the joint rules specify the procedures for exchanging messages. And Secretary Sorry. Boddard, I'd encourage you or invite you to remain where you're at as we're having this discussion, if you don't mind. Don't go far. Say again, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just inviting you to remain right where you're at as we're having this discussion, Secretary Boddard. Very good. Senator Pratt. And thank you, Madam Chair and staff. Our, our staff has informed me that it's Rule 43, transmitting bills to the House. Rule 2043. And since I'm not, I'm only seeing shall the must, I'm assuming that that will remain in practice. So thank you for allowing me to question that. Absolutely, Senator Pratt. Senator Dibble? There's um, no change. Thank there. you. Um, the next question I have is on uh, conference committees, Rule 46. Um, the changes to um, who might be named to a conference committee, where it says the language added, um, the law of where practice subcommittee uh, must give preference to offers of bills in this view. Uh, members of standing committees in which the bills were considered oh, and to members who are in accord with the position of the Senate. Um, so that's, um, that would suggest that preference is given to those individuals, but it's not hard and fast that someone has to have voted for a bill. Uh, Ms. Stangle. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Dibble, that is correct. You can see a uh, few lines earlier, there was a hard and fast requirement. It was a shall appoint a few lines earlier, shall appoint those who are in accord. So that was stricken, and now you are correct that it is listed as a factor that must be considered, but it's no longer a hard and fast. Great. I think that's the uh, sure. Senator Dibble. I think that's a positive. Senator Dibble, Senator Rest. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Dibble. I, I, when reading through that, I made that suggestion because um, we have found on occasion that um, <clears throat> uh, either a member of the other party that may be in agreement with much of a bill nevertheless feels like they, um, they have to cast a negative vote, and we have overlooked that rule of um, they have to have voted for it. I know that's happened in the in the uh, uh, in the tax committee, um, and no one has objected to it. But it seems like to me that it should be um, a strong recommendation, but not a, um, a not a requirement. Because sometimes even someone who has voted against a bill, and I recall <coughs> um, Senator uh, Gazelka when he was the um, uh, the uh, minority lead and the minority, maybe even minority leader on the tax committee <clears throat> um, was a uh, preferred member of the, um, of the conference committee and was put on it by, um, by uh, <clears throat> the uh, majority leader. And it may have, I know it's happened other times as well with Senator Weber um, under the uh, direction of Senator uh, <clears throat> Senator um, Dietzik, the rule was ignored, so why not just put the strong preference and allow people to use their judgment? So thanks for confirming your yeah. agreement with that. Senator Dibble? Thanks. Just to add to that, uh, um, not to be dilatory, but um, there are instances when I would have liked to have gone on to a conference committee having voted against an omnibus bill, likewise have wanted a member of the other party to be on a conference committee who had felt that they needed to vote against um, a bill of mine. Um, so I'm glad there might be the opportunity then to invite those people on because the contribution they make is uh, extremely important. Um, then finally, uh, Senator one, um, I see that, uh, and, and we 
this was presented when, uh, at the last meeting, and I just didn't have the opportunity to circle back. We're, we're getting rid of vast swaths of things. What I'm most interested in is getting rid of the Committee of the Whole, and just wondering if we're doing that because we don't really use Committee of the Whole these days. It's kind of an old chestnut. Um, I only ask because um, when I was a mere whippersnapper mm -hmm. of a senator, we did make extensive use of Committee of the Whole. I don't remember exactly why, but it was extremely important at that time for some reason or another. Um, I think it had to do with tension. Um, uh, have we looked at that period of time when it was last used extensively and thought those circumstances will never arise again and or we don't want to put ourselves in the position of making use of the Committee of the Whole for the purposes for which it was used then and it's just become an obsolete um, mm. procedure, <clears throat> mechanism, structure. Thanks, Senator Dibble. Um, and that I will turn to Secretary Bodern um, as he had um, recommended this after doing some research, uh, which I think was a lot about the fact that we haven't used it in some time. Secretary Bodern. Madam Chair and Senator Dibble, um, and apologize in a side conversation here, but I think the question is generally um, related to the use of the Committee of the Whole, why it might not be used presently, um, whether it could be um, reinstituted. And I think one, one point I would make at the outset is that um, it's sort of a direction that is set, at least looking back over the last decade, from uh, biennium to biennium, you know, what the current majority would prefer to do in the way of treating bills. And certainly if there were a desire at the beginning of a biennium to reinstitute the process, it would be a relatively straightforward matter to amend the rules accordingly and revive that process. I think there, there are two points that come to mind fairly quickly in terms of why the Committee of the Whole might be used less presently. Certainly one is um, the, it adds an extra day um, for passage of legislation. You could, you know, obviously there are pros and cons perhaps related to that, but where there's a desire to move with some speed, um, it's a slower process. The other point I'd make, and I think this is getting into the realm of, you know, observing trends, the use of the Committee of the Whole relied greatly on the avoidance of roll call votes. Um, much of the debate and activity on when the Senate was in the Committee of the Whole was done through voice votes. That enabled it to move quickly and more informally um, through legislation, obviously without taking final action. Um, that trend seems to have changed, and really you would lose a lot of the advantage that the Committee of the Whole might convey from a deliberative point of view if there were many roll call votes. Those are just two things that come to mind fairly quickly. Um, obviously, part of the recommendation was simply looking at the um, you know, this has been used once, I think, since 2010, this process. Senator Dibble. Well, I'm not going to mount a mighty effort to restore the Committee of the Whole. Um, it'll still be there if, you know, we can pull out of the trash heap of history if we need to and re revive it. Um, I just, I was just honestly curious because, uh, you know, I was a, a fairly young senator then. We used it, I think, exclusively for one or two years. Mm -hmm. I think it was about the threshold of voting necessary in committee of the whole versus passing a bill with the 34 vote majority. Um, and there was a lot of tension around a particular subject or several subjects. So um, yeah, that, that helped. Thanks, I appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Hmm. No, Senator Pappas. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. As I've read through the rules, I, I have to admit to a certain um, nostalgia as losing the shall which is so much more elegant than the must. But I understand that we're trying to make the language more modern and specific. And to that end, I have a question about Rule 14.1, uh, um, 930, actually, Section 14, but line 930, where it says that the president must immediately call the members to order and on the appearance of a quorum. So I was curious about what the appearance of a quorum is when we're trying to make things more specific, uh, you know, or should it be, a, does that mean a quorum is present, or Mr. Bodder, and what is the appearance of a quorum, as opposed to the reality of a quorum? <laughs> Secretary Bodder. Madam Chair, I think that language is shorthand for the judgment of the president in taking a look at the Senate chamber and uh, a quick determination whether a quorum would be present. Sometimes that's quite obvious. 
Uh, you could imagine it could take a little more time, just uh, you know, visually. And obviously, there are other methods to validate that uh, that take a little With longer. The boat, right. Okay. And Madam Chair, if I could follow up on line 933, as we're um, changing all the mays to either, I guess either may or must. Then it talks about. It's just kind of confusing to me. For purpose of establishing a quorum, members who have informed the president of their intention to vote from a remote location under the provisions of Rule 40.7 may be counted for the duration of a legislative day. But if a member suggests the absence of a quorum, the president must confirm. So what's the difference between the may be counted to the must confirm? I just find that kind of confusing. Senator Rest. Thank you. I think um, usually following um, the um, reading of the rule, the president does say a quorum, quorum is, present. Is, is present. So that's that's the answer to the uh, first question. And <clears throat> and um, maybe it's a little bit old-fashioned language, but that's what happens. I think uh, most of us don't even realize that this, that the uh, president has made that statement because we're not mm -hmm. paying attention. Right. Um, but uh, he routinely um, does make that. After 34 votes on the board, that, though. Um, yes. He'll, so when it's when the roll is called by the, by the secretary, following that, the president says a quorum is present mm -hmm. because it's obvious. Usually, two, we have uh, checked in. <laughs> Um, on the board, mm -hmm. and then he rule, reads, reads the, the rule, and um, uh, he has been presented with the, um, the names and the locations according to the rules of those who are voting uh, uh, remotely and is able to count them as mm -hmm. present, as presence, as present in determining that a quorum mm -hmm. that. Uh, has been. Uh, uh, reach. It's a formality, but and then at any time someone can can uh, uh, challenge um, on the floor. You know, if nobody's sitting there, somebody can ask for a quorum call, and uh, um, by by the motion or not the motion, it's a request um, to impose a call of the Senate. That is another. That is the second way of determining whether there is a. Um, uh, a quorum, and once there are 34 votes, including those that are voting remotely, once that has been um, uh, achieved, there's there is the motion that the that the roll call be dispensed with, and the sergeant of arms be instructed to bring in the the um, absent members. But once there are 34 votes that are indicated on the at least that on the um, on the uh, electronic board, um, along with the number of um, uh, yesterday, there were like 10 people, um, counting those 10 people, that um, a quorum, a, a, the quorum call has been met. Madam Chair, I, I accept that, what, Senator ba what uh, Mr. Bodern said and what Senator Rest is confirming. My question has to do with line 933, when we now we just say that they may be counted, couldn't we say they are counted for the duration of the legislative day unless a member asks for a quorum call? So they continue to be so, counted. I get it. it. Not it's not it's not optional. That's kind of I don't I don't think we have to say must be counted, but are counted. Senator Rest. Um, uh, Senator Pampas, I think a a, um, a simple. Uh, change of language there would accomplish that to say that uh, the intention to vote for a remote location under provisions of four, Rule 40.7 are to be counted. Yeah. And that, rather than saying must, it's that. Yeah, are counted or are to be counted. It's not either one. A re in that sense. And I would um, join you in making that amendment um, when the time comes. To strike May and add R2. I will um, call on Secretary Bodern for a reaction to that and then to remind the committee as we're working our way through this that we do have now 
a very small uh, list of uh, both oral and other amendments that we'll need to take up. Secretary Bowden to the debate about May versus R. <laughs> Madam Chair and <laughs> Senators Pappas and Rest, I'm not sure that I see a great distinction between are to be and shall or must. Um, I think you know the question is whether it has to be absolute. Um, I'd want to give it a little further thought. It may be necessary to preserve some discretion for the president if a member has been voting remotely and then informs the president I would like to be excused for the rest of the day, that kind of thing. I just think it, it's helpful to leave a little bit of room for the president to handle that one. Thank you, Madam Chair. That makes sense. So I understand. Thank you, Senator Pappas. I see Senator Draskowski, then Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just curious, um, maybe if Mr. Bowden can answer the question um, on lines 934 and 935, it says the president must confirm that each member intending to vote under 40.7 intends to continue. How, will, how does that happen? How would the, how would the president ascertain that? Secretary Bowden. Madam Chair, Senator Draskowski, I, we live in an electronic age. I think there'd be a variety of methods for communicating with a member. Um, certainly, the and, and there's a lot of discretion for the president here. A staff member could confirm that for the president, um, you know, perhaps it more indirectly. Text messages, emails, um, direct phone call, a whole variety of methods. Thank you, Secretary Bodner. Secretary, or excuse me, Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Secretary Bodner. So, it, I mean, so it, it appears that there would be a pause at that point of some sort, and all that would happen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Secretary Bodner addressed my my first question uh, to follow up on Senator Jaskowski's question, uh, Mr. Bodner. Would the expectation that uh, this is so under, under current rules, um, the caucus leader or their designee may uh, announce the votes of, of members voting remotely. Um, would there be an expectation that the president confirm directly with the member that they are uh, still voting remotely versus being excused, or would it be incumbent upon the caucus leader to say that that member is still uh, voting remotely. Secretary Bowden. Madam Chair, I don't think um, the way the rule is presently written would require confirmation with a caucus leader. Again, um, you know, when I look at this language, the president must confirm that each member intending to vote under Rule 40.7 intends to continue uh, voting under Rule 40.7. Um, I guess I would say I think that leaves considerable discretion for the president. And when we think about the manner in which the president is informed that members intend to vote remotely at the beginning of the day, um, it would need to be in conformity with that practice. So typically, uh, caucus staff are providing a message, uh, you know, communicating with the president to let them know that certain members will be voting remotely, and that fact is then announced. So I'd see it as kind of as an extension of that earlier process. Thank you, Senator Pratt. All right. Seeing no further questions, um, we should move to the amendment phase of our exercise today. And if it is okay, I'd like to begin with the A1, which is technical in nature. Um, and so I'd ask Senator Pappas to move the A1 amendment and then turn to Ms. Stengel. This is on page 21. And this is a language change that uh, I think this emerged in discussions with Senator Rust and with Senator Johnson. Ms. Stengel. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This amends a provision that came from the Senator Murphy proposal, and this is amending Rule 39. So the sentence right now before the amendment reads, the author of the bill, amendment, or resolution being divided must determine which portion to vote on first. Um, and in a division, it's not really the author of the bill or amendment or resolution that's deciding on what to vote on. It's actually the person that's making, um, that's, that's offering the question or the motion. Um, so this is 
changing that to be a little bit more precise. So after the amendment, it would read, the author of the question being divided must determine the portion to vote on first. So it's a technical amendment um, to clean up and make it more precise. Any questions? Senator Pappas renews her motion on the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And as opposed, say no. And that motion is adopted. Are there other amendments? Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to offer the A2 amendment. We'll just go in chronological order. <laughs> tell. Senator Pratt, would you like to explain the A2 amendment as it's being distributed? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and, and members. Um, it has to do with uh, the new rule beginning on line 9.23. Uh, committee chair may establish written procedures for conducting committee hearings. Uh, the chair must make the written procedures available to members of the public and put the public. It's my understanding that uh, this is a way of enforcing some decorum in, in many cases, and, and I believe Senator Rest has, has done this in the past or, or something similar, and I think it's a worthy uh, endeavor. So the question comes um, that if it's truly around decorum and making sure that we have um, established uh, procedures that it also include uh, consultation and approval of the ranking a minority member of the committee so that um, th there's true bipartisan support um, on the rules and procedures and decorum that will that um, that are being uh, implemented for the committee it's I'm, I'm hoping it's a fairly technical change Senator rest well uh, mr. chair uh, madam chair and um, and Senator Pratt I don't think it's technical <clears throat> Um, in, um, in some committees now, um, chairs allow um, um, personal photography. I do not allow it in the, in the uh, tax committee. And quite frankly, I don't care whether the ranking minority member um, thinks it's okay or not. I think I should have the authority to say no photography other than by credentialed, credentialed media and or the... Um, uh, Senate photographer, and if you want to do that, you have to go um, outside in the hallway. I mean, that part's fine, or after or before. And also, um, uh, um, I would not agree if the ranking minority member said, well, I think it's okay to eat food at the table. Um, so um, I don't mind the first part of that um, after consulting with, but certainly not the, um, not the approval. That should be the prerogative of the chair of the committee. Senator Pratt. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that, Senator Rust. I, I appreciate that, and I, um, I would hope that there's not debate over, over questions like that. My concern becomes when it extends beyond, the, the possibility could st extend beyond mm -hmm. those types of things. Maybe it has to do with testifiers, or maybe it has to do with, um, you know, we've talked about equal time for, for opponents and proponents, and maybe a, a chair could extend it in such a way that it favors one side versus uh, the other versus being uh, uh, more equitable. And, and that's more of, of where I'm coming from. I would, I would hope that the types of things that you're talking about wouldn't be objectionable. And... Um, more worried about as time goes on, as you've talked about, this, these should be rules that that live beyond just the rest of this session, but should be easily adoptable for, for the next legislature and, and hopefully a decade beyond. Um, and that's where I'm going with it. Senator Rest. So um, I, I appreciate that, but I still can't support this um, uh, amendment. What um, 
What I think it, we do need to do, however, is um, to have some latitude for chairs um, to have um, uh, slightly different protocols for achieving decorum in their in their committees. And one topic that had come up, um, how to achieve that, so that everybody knows, is to ask that the um, protocols that are going to be followed in a committee be um, available to the public, and um, and copies be made available to the. Um, the committee on on rules so that if someone wants to really object to something they would have a place to go to do that and that members of the public would uh, would know and um, in room 15 we do uh, put signs up saying these are behaviors that are are not acceptable in this um, in this um, in this committee room um, and it doesn't mean necessary. We're not talking about disruptive behaviors, but we're saying no. You can't bring your cup of coffee in here and then spill it on the on the uh, on the carpet and then um, uh, and then um, leave it to the sergeants to come and and pick up after your mess. And um, that's very expensive um, because the carpets have to be uh, cleaned. Um, again, I don't. I don't. Um, I don't have any problem with uh, consulting with the whole committee, <laughs> much less just a, a minority member. But it should be the chair's decision. And then, if you don't like it, you can appeal it to the committee on rules. Is what I would. What I would say. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair, and and Senator Rest. Well, I'm not seeing where there's the ability for the the committee of rules to to override this decision and maybe you can help me understand that um, Senator thank, rest thank you madam chair senator um, Pratt I think that is um, that's still an open question about um, uh, when because the, the the whole notion that a chair should have an obligation to um, um, publish in the broadest sense uh, let people know um, uh, what protocols are going to be observed in that uh, in that committee? Another one might be um, we permit um, throughout this in, in committees uh, people to testify uh, remotely. Um, in the tax committee, um, that that um, um, permission is modified to the point that. Um, registered and paid lobbyists may not testify um, remotely. Anybody else can, but uh, not someone who's being um, paid by a group who, instead of being in St. Paul to testify in person, is in Las Vegas gambling away on a vacation. Um, that, that is not permitted in the tax committee. And I can't imagine that the uh, um, in this instance, that Senator uh, Weber would disagree with that at all. So I like the term of, uh, uh, of consultation, but not the rest of it. And, um, and the requirement of um, chairs developing um, protocols. People should, should know what's expected of them when they come in. And some chairs are going to be wide open and, and um, uh, be um, uh, um, um, I'm not, you know, I'll, I'll say flexible than than others, and we should respect their styles and their their authority, and not expect that we're all uh, that we're all the same, and and part of that depends on the kind of committee it is, um, and what kinds of testimony you have, um, for example. Again, I mean, I only use my own experience. We're taking up the omnibus tax bill. Um, I don't want to hear from uh, it. It is inefficient to hear from people who support it. Um, we say in the tax committee, if you oppose anything in this bill, you're the people we want to hear from, not the people who um, uh, support it. 
And it also allows just some flexibility to even break your own rule. Um, um, but uh, every committee that I am a member of um, uh, handles general concerns and considerations of, um, uh, of protocol a little bit differently. And I think that's a strength of our system because it reflects the, um, uh, the personality and the uh, approach to legislating that um, uh, is revealed with the, um, by, the, by the chair himself or, or, or herself. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, Senator Rest, I, I, I agree with part of your, your statement. Um, my concern is the language doesn't limit us to decorum. I don't think that coffee and pictures are procedures, right? Um, That's and, different. And I would like to, see, and, and so my fear is that, it, as I mentioned, as we go on for many, many years, um, that the, the use of this rule uh, gets, gets broadened beyond what we, what we initially intend today. Um, it also creates a patchwork and I would actually like to see us maybe come up with more standard procedures for all committees to follow. I think, uh, you know, whether you're in the MSB or, or whether in G15, there are certain um, traditions, protocols that, um, that should be followed, but I, I'd be happy to continue to, to have this discussion right. offline okay. with you. But, and Madam Chair? Senator Rest. Just a final comment on that. Um, I would just like the members and the chairs of committees to uh, follow the rules that we do have. We have some chairs who think they can make motions. They cannot. We have chairs that say, oh, it's a friendly amendment. There is no such thing as a friendly amendment. And if, somehow if it's a friendly amendment, you don't have to vote on it. Um, we need a little bit better instruction of members and chairs on how we, we're very formal on the floor. Um, and um, those procedures, um, uh, Masons applies in committees as well as anywhere else. Chairs can't make motions. <laughs> um, and, uh, and friendly amendments uh, are a, a fiction of someone's imagination. There's no such thing. Um, and, and I'm happy to continue this discussion slash argument um, <laughs> offline. I have Senator Dibble, Senator Draskowski, Senator Pappas, all engaging in a friendly discussion. <laughs> okay, go ahead and argue. <laughs> yeah. Dibble. Uh, I don't have much to add. I was just going to say that I, I would support the A2 as presented um, and also would support it um, with the, and the approval of language taken out. I think in either, either way um, is, is fine, I, I think desirable. Um, you know, I, I have a history of, of working very cooperatively with um, the other party, both when I was in the minority as well as at present, um, and uh, and the approval of the. I mean, I understand why that creates some angst because who knows, you know, what might be not approved or you know insisted upon, but um, but I do think it sets the right tone from the outset of the relationship of the chair with the ranking member. And so all in all, I like the A2. Thank you. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, by the way, uh, Madam Other Chair, um, I'm on, I'm on uh, Senator Rest's committee and uh, I, I like your rules. And, uh, and I think um, if you've got a good chair, she or he is in um, really good using your words, um, Madam Chair, harmonization, what was it? I haven't heard that word for a long time. Thank you for <laughs> using that. Um, if they're in harmonization with their committee, um, they indeed shouldn't run aground. Um, you know, you could go another step and say, you know, maybe it requires approval of the committee, you know, majority okay. vote, which, you and know, I, I, like would that that the, I would think that the chair of the committee could, you know, leverage their majority to do that as long as it's not a rogue chair, you know, I think you'd be 
you'd be okay. So that might be another approach. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to see some version of this, either strike uh, and the approval of to, mm -hmm. to do this or do that and add uh, uh, with approval of the, uh, of the committee. Senator Peppis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, I would like to amend the amendment to delete and the approval of, and then I would be happy to support the amendment. If Senator Pratt wants to accept that or... Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Pappas. I, I think I actually prefer the, the recommendation of <laughs> Senator Driskowski on, on the committee because what we're asking is, is the committee as a whole, the, the, the entire committee, I don't want to say committee as a whole, that has a different connotation, but the entire mm -hmm. committee to abide by and, and adopt these practices. And so I would actually be more... Uh, favorable to, to Senator Dreskowski's uh, proposal. Senator Rest to the Thank you. amendment. Uh, Senator amendment. Pratt, um, I think um, we're all in some sort of general agreement, but not with the specific language, and we could take a lot of time here do, doing that. So I, I would like to request that you withdraw the amendment and that we um, work on something that, that uh, gets to his point and and um, and yours and Senator Pappas's and and uh, wherever Senator Dibble is on this. <laughs> Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and is the intention to pass these proposed rules out today or are we going to have another meeting for the type of conversation Senator Rust and I are Senator Rest proposed we have. Our intention, Senator Pratt, is to move these today uh, when we're done uh, to the Rules Committee um, where there will be another opportunity to debate, discuss, and amend. And then to the floor uh, probably the week after that. So we've got a couple of weeks in front of us yet of work uh, where we'll have opportunities to debate, discuss, and amend. Senator Pratt. Uh, May I have a parliamentary inquiry? <laughs> <laughs> Do your level best, Senator Pratt. Thank you. So we have, uh, am, I, am I able to withdraw an amendment with a motion to amend the amendment on the table? Uh, Senator Pratt, uh, Ms. Dangle, nods her head yes. Okay, yes. then I will uh, withdraw the amendment for now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank well, you, Senator you. Pratt. Senator Dreskowski. I'm just curious, could staff draft that amendment while we're doing this and we could come back and Senator Pratt would have his new amendment? Is that doable? It's a pretty small amendment. Well, I think Senator Dreskowski, the question is what would the amendment contain? I think the proposal was to, strike, to use Senator Pappas's uh, strike and the approval of and then add in some form of requiring approval of the committee. So how about this? We've, uh, Senator Pratt has withdrawn his amendment. Uh, if there is an interest in moving that, we can get it drafted and move it again while we're here this afternoon. Um, and Thank if you. there's not, uh, then there will be discussion between now and the next hearing. Senator Thank you. Rest. And, and I, I would um, appreciate more private conversation about getting the language right and not doing it on the fly to meet the goals of every, everybody. And, and I will, um, the results of that conversation, I would support a, a different wording of this amendment in the full rules committee where I think it would be accepted. So, no. <laughs> right. All right, so when the rules committee meets, then I'll be anticipating a Pratt rest or rest Pratt amendment dealing with this issue yes. for our considerations. Yes. All right. Other amendments? Senator Draskowski. I've got the A3 amendment. A staying A3. staying in order, Madam Chair. The amendment's being distributed. I'm going to turn to the right page in the resolution here. Okay. Would you like to proceed, Senator Draskowski? Yes. Um, so, Madam Chair, um, this, this, this is dealing with the, um, the question of proxy voting. And, and uh, 
I know that there's a piece in here that um, directs the secretary to come back with a recommendation to the body for uh, eventual adoption next year. Um, I think given what is happening in the other body, um, I think there's a possibility. Uh, so essentially, let me, let me go over uh, another one of, of Chair Rest's uh, requirements is that when you present a bill, you have to actually describe what it does first. So and I think that's a good one as well, a good protocol. Uh, what this does is says um, that, uh, that when uh, a member votes remotely, their voice has to be heard audibly um, in order for them to continue voting remotely. Um, and that's what they, that's one of the options that they have in the House. And so um, I thought I'd bring this forward as a proposal and I, I'm gonna withdraw the proposal, Madam Chair, but I just wanna say that um, uh, I've had discussions with Senator Rest and Senator Pratt and, and others um, about going over and actually talking to the House about what they are doing. And we've got a meeting set up for next Tuesday tentatively. And so any members of this committee or any other members of the Senate that would like to join us, we would like to do a, and it shouldn't take a super long time, but see if something could be implemented for this year yet that would help provide that certainty of, of that person's voice. And, and I, Madam Chair, members uh, during COVID experienced that in the House, when you hear the, when you hear the voice of the other member, you know it's the other member. And that, that's very reassuring and meaningful. And it, it helps trust, and it helps, uh, it helps really just make sure that we have strong integrity all the way through the process. So um, with that, uh, unless someone else wants to discuss this right now, Madam Chair, I'll withdraw the amendment. Good. Thank you, Senator Jeskowski, and I look forward to the results of the field trip. Are there other amendments? Oral amendments? I have one, but I'm waiting for the A4 to come forward. Right. Senator Rest, did you have an idea? Does of somebody a have an A4 or not? Maybe there's not an A4. Hmm. There you oh, yes. Senator Rest. Um, um, uh, Ms. Stangel, the, the um, repositioning of the words once adopted. Okay. okay. All right. Then Senator Draskowski moves the A4 amendment. Um, I think Senator Rest is. Senator Rest is moving the A4 amendment. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Madam Chair. And this is a reference uh, um, to just make it clear that we're following Masons about third degree amendments to amendments to amendments, and that um, it would now, on page, 19, um, that it, the line would then read an amendment, um, and this is current practice, we just want to reassert it. Um, an amendment uh, to an amendment, once adopted, may be amended. And um, uh, this would be available for all members without having to look at Masons, that this is our practice, and um, we don't have to get entangled in it ever again. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Rest and Senator Dreskowski. I, I know you spent a lot of time in the retiring room Talking uh, this. debating this and, and parsing words, and I got, a, I got the privilege to, to sit on a portion of that conversation. Me too. Um, <laughs> this was... Uh, while these words are, just, are simple changes, it was not a simple process to get there, and I, I just wanted to say I appreciate your uh, efforts for, for moving this forward. I had the privilege of joining that conversation for a brief moment as well. It was a smart conversation. It was fascinating. It was fascinating. <laughs> That's right. So uh, seeing no further discussion, Senator Rest renews her motion on the A4 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And as opposed, say no, and that motion is adopted. <laughs> Senator Dibble. Sure you may. Senator Dibble. Uh, my first question um, regarding the, the necessary approval of the respective copies of this requirement and uh, on the floor.
waiting for counsel to make sure she has the oral amendment. And Ms. Dangle, if you could repeat the oral amendment being offered by Senator Dibble. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Amending Senate Resolution 029-16 on page eight, line one, delete with approval of the respective caucus leader, comma. And on page 21, line 23, strike with the approval of and on page 21, line 24, strike the respective caucus leader, comma. Senator Dibble? That's my motion. I've expressed my reasons earlier. I think this is important enough of uh, uh, an issue around how we all come and participate um, that reaches past and beyond um, partisan and caucus difference, and it has more to do with our responsibility that's conferred upon us through our election and our representation of our constituents. And we should be able to come to the Senate and participate on an equal footing in ways that are commensurate with each other. And you, in a way that the public can know and predict and understand and not have to differentiate. Senator Rest. Um, uh, Madam Chair, if that is a single amendment, I, I would actually like to divide it. Sorry. <laughs> Senator Rest. I think dividing is fine. Um, I Senator would, Rest moves to divide the oral amendment. Yes. To, oh, uh, I, that's right. I, I'm so glad to have this person. You can proceed. Yeah, yeah. Please proceed, Senator Rest. Yes. Um, um, to separate the um, the language that you want to strike on lines eight point one with the language at, separately from um, uh, the language of the approval of the caucus leaders for. Um, Voting remotely on the on the floor, um, or, and then so that's where I would separate it, and then I would, and then I would want to know um, from him which part to work on <laughs> to comment on first, and then I would like to speak to it. Senator Dibble, or or alternatively. Madam Chair, I could withdraw my amendment and offer them each separately. Would that be preferable? That's okay, too. All right. Senator Dibble. All right. Um, so I will withdraw my amendment, and I will offer, I mean, I'll just go in, chrono, or in, in you know, page order. Um, so I would offer the first part of the amendment first, so the deletion of the language on line 8.1. having to do with committees. So Senator Dibble uh, moves an oral amendment. Ms. Dangle, would you like to put it into the record? Yes, Madam Chair, the oral amendment is on page eight, line one, to delete with approval of the respective caucus leader, comma. Senator Rest. Um, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Dibble, I, um, I actually think that is a, um, a, a good deletion here to let let a member um, uh, be recorded in the, in a committee um, on their um, in a sense on their own authority, and if, um, you have to tell the clerk in a committee um, uh, if you're going to be there or not. Or and uh, uh, again, some of us have a, a different. Um, different protocols with regard to that, but um, seems like to me a member should be able to decide in the committee um, whether they um, want to participate remotely or not, and they shouldn't have to go to anywhere. I mean, if they were gonna go anywhere, it should be to the committee chair, but, um, but it seems to me that we can take that provision um, 
out and leave the other one in for because it, that for right now that 34 votes is pretty important on the on the on the Senate floor um, but I would I would support removing it here and letting uh, letting uh, uh, members uh, work it out in committee themselves um, rather than having to get permission from a uh, from um, the caucus leader, and if they're not there, uh, you know they're absent. In my committee, if you're absent, you're excused automatically. That's that's a protocol I follow. Um, otherwise, if you are promote, and you have to let the clerk know if you're going to. Uh, uh, that's just a courtesy uh, to let the clerk know that you are, are, are the uh, legislative committee legislative assistant that you're going to be per, per, uh, participating um, uh, remotely. And, and this just sounds a little bit too much big brotherish. <laughs> so I would support removing it at, on, on 8.1 and hope that you don't offer the other one. <laughs> Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the Dibble oral amendment on page 8, line 1, please say aye. 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 Uh, and, those aye. That aye. Opposed, and those that are opposed say no. And that motion is adopted. Mm -hmm. Senator Dibble. Well, I know that Senator Rest hopes I don't offer the second part of my amendment, but I, I don't actually see a big distinction between the two, and my feelings remain the same about the importance of us coming to the Senate um, on an even keel, on a, on, a, on a level playing field, and I think it's important also for our, the public to be able to understand um, what to expect in terms of our presence uh, remotely or, or otherwise. Um, so that they're not confused why some are and some aren't able to participate remotely in Senate chamber proceedings. Even though I know we all are now, but that might not be true in the future. Um, and that would be, I think, very confusing. I would be confused by that if I were a new senator and didn't know that things might be different between caucuses, you know, depending on, you know, RD. And uh, I certainly think our public would be confused why the differentiation and the distinction. So I will offer the second part of my amendment. Before um, we go to questions, I'll ask Ms. Stengel just to renew our understanding of the oral amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator DeBolt, on page 21, line 23, <coughs> strike with the approval of, and on page 21, line 24, strike the respective caucus leader, comma. Are there questions? Yeah, Senator Rest. Well, I, I'm going to um, oppose um, this uh, amendment. I do think that leaders of the caucuses uh, have a responsibility to the, um, to the body and to their own caucuses um, about um, the, what should be extraordinary circumstances um, under which a, um, a member um, uh, may vote um, uh, may vote remotely, but that um, if um, they um, at this point, if the DFL uh, caucus leader wants to um, have and and does present every session at this point, um, the rules under which uh, she or he would. Um, uh, uh, approve voting remotely, which may not include things like uh, going to Washington on a conference um, for a conference, and I'll, I'm just I'll just vote from my hotel room um, in between uh, sessions of what uh, the meeting I'm going to. Um, if that person, if that leader wants to do that, and the leader of the uh, uh, Republican caucus um, says uh, nope, the that is not going to be the standard that our caucus um, holds. I, 
I think that we should uh, uh, respect that. And uh, on, on another kind of issue, but that was a, a, has been a difference, um, uh, when Senator Gazelko was the uh, uh, majority leader, he, uh, I don't think it was when he was minority leader, um, his um, announcement with regard to per diem during the, um, uh, during the interim is that there would be none um, for committee meetings, period. Um, uh, Senator Dietzik had a, um, a different memo out with regard to uh, uh, what kind of attendance at, um, at um, uh, committee meetings um, during the interim would warrant um, the application or approval of um, per diem, and I, um, and that was that was different as well. So I, um, I think uh, that um, we need to keep in place that respect for the um, for the caucus leaders, and and also to be very careful that we do not. Um, put in Senate rules uh, provisions that only apply to joint rules or that um, uh, where another body in the legislature, for example, the Legislative Coordinating Commission has rules on, um, on um, uh, legislative commissions that we do not have and we do not have jurisdiction over them, like um, uh, legislative commissions must um, obey the open open meeting law, and we don't require that, and we cannot overcome that um, by saying the open meeting law doesn't re doesn't apply to Senate members of the <coughs> Legislative Audit Commission. That that um, that is gets beyond what what we can uh, we we can do according to the setup of of. Um, of the different kinds of organizations we have, so I, I, I believe that the law, that the um, uh, majority leader uh, needs to work that out within their caucus about what is permitted, um, and well, permitted in the sense of what would be approved, and that um, uh, members um, uh, should respect that and not ask to be. Um, excused or not, well, we can be excused, of course, but that's their prerogative, but not vote remotely when they um, are um, uh, on the beach in Florida. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I, uh, I'm persuaded in part by Senator Rest. <laughs> um, this is a more complicated matter. What I'm, what I'm focused on is, would, would be the ability of a caucus leader to say there is no circumstance under which someone will be able to participate remotely. So then we have one caucus that has got very disparate circumstance and conditions for participating um, as contrasted with, you know, run around, do your thing, uh, which also would be undesirable. Um, so I would, I would like the opportunity to think more about this, um, and work, I mean, work on it further, um, cause I do think that Senator Rest raises some good points about creating some expectation for the circumstance when someone can and should be participating remotely in Senate floor business. But to my earlier point, I don't think a caucus leader should have complete and total blanket authority to bar remote participation if we agree that um, remote participation um, is a recognition of how we should operate in the future under certain circumstances. So I will throw my amendment. Um, Senator Dibble um, withdraws his uh, oral amendment. I will say as you are deliberating this, Senator Dibble, 
what I was thinking through as um, you and Senator Russ were discussing was just the notification. And I think there is a difference between notification and approval um, and the expectation in the sort of advancing understanding of remote participation and where we want to put our arms around that. I do, I do think, if I recall correctly, when we came into this term uh, and, we, and we did some discussion of temporary rules, there were some changes made. I think that was at the beginning of this term. Um, and I appreciate very much the, the pause and the thoughtfulness of, a, of an approach rather than trying to make the decision right here. Um, because I think it'll render a better outcome. And I, I do think you are wrestling with something that is a, a, a sort of the change that is resulting from the, the, the way in which we do our work. And it's not just us when we think about remoteness, but I, you know, I think about the practice of healthcare that is um, becoming not in one space, but in places. Uh, and what does that mean? I, we're wrestling with this question in general in our day-to-day -day work. So I appreciate your your willingness to work on it and think it through before we bring it back in perhaps a dibble or rest um, amendment right. to the Rules Committee. Right. Senator Pappas. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. As I've thought about this, um, I actually think it would probably be more desirable if we had rules that apply to everyone and not make it mm -hmm. partisan rules. Um, it just seems to me that that is a, an expectation that we should just have as a body. Um, and I do think that it makes me nervous to the more we move toward remote because I think we do lose something when we don't have that in-person contact and mm -hmm. that collegiality and that ability to talk to people in the retiring room or in the hallway um, because we're, you know, we're all operating remotely. So um, I appreciate... Um, uh, Senator Dibble's comments and others, but I do think that perhaps we should rethink this about uh, can there just be standard rules, whether it is, you know, I don't know, health circumstances. We certainly have seen that a lot in both caucuses, um, or military duties, or, you know, some kind of requirements that you can't, um, you can't control. They're all kind of outside your control. And it just makes me nervous when, you know, too many people are missing from the floor, and I thought, well, all these people can't be sick. No, they just feel like going home, whatever. Um, and I don't think that's a very, that's a, and they are accountable to their voters, but you know, the voters are not following that closely to see whether people are really um, engaging or not. Oh, we don't, and I think a scandal of somebody from the golf course or from the beach, that, that implicates all of us, you know, if that happens. It's just like going to a conference and not really going to the conference but you know, doing something else, right? And that's certainly happened in the past. Uh, Senator Draskowski and then Senator Russ, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm certainly not opposed to finding a different way to meter this participation. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm not in favor of remote voting. I never have been. Um, I was opposed to it during COVID. Um, I think um, it's unconstitutional. Our Constitution, if our mind, everyone says that the seat of government shall be St. Paul, Minnesota, and all, and the legislature shall meet at the seat of government. And that's here. And so I, I don't believe it's remote voting is constitutional to begin with, but if indeed the desire of this body is to continue to do it in some form or another, I think we should have something that not encourages more and more and more remote voting, but rather something that discourages it, uh, or at least brings it to a level that it's absolutely necessary um, for remote voting. I mean, Senator Pappas, you'd have the same scandal if the person was simply desiring to participate at home, and they're perfectly healthy, and there was no other reason for them not to be here. Um, you might even have the same scandal if they said their car broke down. I mean, there's a million other cars in the state. Um, but again, I'm I, I, Senator Dibble, I think you bringing it up at least has us think about how that is metered. I, I can't think of a better word for that, but we should 
we should have a we should have a governor on this. I don't mean an executive, a different, a chief executive. I mean a governor on an engine. There should be a a governor that uh, where the brake is attached tightly um, to it. And I don't know how that is. I understand your your reservations about one person making that call, but I think we should have policy that that discourages this rather than encourages it. We should, instead of having 10 members, Senator Rest gone like it was yesterday, um, maybe it should be one or two um, or attempt to get back to zero because I, I don't have to remind many of us here that it wasn't long ago uh, that we did operate constitutionally and that if someone um, was sick, if someone was gonna have a baby or other things, they made the call on their own whether or not they were, whether they were going to look after their health first or whether they're gonna look after their responsibilities here. And that decision was made. And guess what? The state went forward and it went forward with the full discussion, Senator Pappas, that you and, and I think Senator Pratt talked about, about that, that deliberation face to face and it happened, and it happened every day. It may not have allowed the majority to uh, ensure that they had the ability and the votes uh, and that they could almost, I, I can't think of a better word, it appears to maybe compel participation to an extent of their members. We shouldn't put members in that position where they have to participate here, potentially at the expense of their health or having a baby or any of the other things that happen, they should be able to make that decision without the weight uh, being on their shoulders. That's, that's my take on it, which is completely different than the spin that I've heard the media and others here bring around this. Um, we should make that, let the member make that choice and the legislature should go on. And it does and has done that in history. There have been many situations there have been members that have died in office, um, but that's part of the kind of the, the way the legislature lives and moves forward. Um, I just think we're going in a dangerous way if we continue to find ways to rationalize more and more of this remote voting. I, I don't think it's constitutional. I don't think it's in our best interest. I don't think it's in our constituents' best interest. That's all I have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Jeskowski. Senator Rest. Um, well, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I couldn't disagree with you more um, on this issue, and we have had discussions um, about it. I, I think that um, uh, we are in different times. We're in extraordinary times. Um, uh, we have um, uh, unique times right now for uh, the Minnesota Senate because uh, Democrats have a one-person uh, uh, majority. And um, uh, the same thing would be true in, uh, if, for the, uh, uh, if the Republicans had a, a one-member uh, majority. And I think that we need to have kind of a, um, uh, a cloak of ignorance, <laughs> if you will, to descend on us and say, okay, I don't know whether I'm gonna be that one person majority or whether I'm gonna be in the minority. How would I want us to proceed humanely with respect for different circumstances that I may or may not myself, if I have this cloak of ignorance, not silence, cloak of ignorance, <laughs> making a decision based on, on that. And I, um, uh, you know, I, in the House one time, not when I was there, but um, it was split because they can do it, 67-67. And they had to really work very hard um, for um, a um, splitting up of responsibilities and committees and, and, um, and so forth and who got to be speaker. And uh, we at least don't, are not faced with um, um, with that, but we do have extraordinary circumstances in our lives that do not, um, uh, even though they may prohibit our physical presence, 
do not in any way uh, cut short our ability to participate as, um, um, as voting members of this body. And I would not like to see um, uh, rules that would come in that would say um, uh, you, uh, you can't participate uh, or you'll have to make it that decision when it's, it's a false choice. You can participate. You just may not be able to be here uh, or in any, uh, on any given, uh, on, in, on any given uh, occasion. And so Senator Driskowski and I very um, respectfully, I might add, um, have a um, very serious disagreement about, about what that means. It is further complicated when um, a, um, a legislative body um, is, um, um, has a majority of women in it. Uh, this is new times, and certainly in our caucus, the majority of our caucus are women. And women have um, traditional, extraordinary uh, responsibilities for their families that uh, men still traditionally do not have and do not have even, even um, in, uh, in, in this day and age. And, um, and in caretaker roles. And I, um, I think that we can do both and respect both and not diminish the participation of any one group of people who, are, who run for the Senate and serve in the Senate. And, um, uh, and not only not diminish it or, re or, or restrict it, but celebrate it celebrate the fact that uh, more and more women believe that they can be um, active in political life and run for office and get elected and, um, and not have those uh, restrictions um, on them. And um, I would hope, quite frankly, that the uh, Republican caucus would, uh, they have great women members. I would, I would like to see one, more women from uh, Republicans also be a part of this, not because they come with a particular outlook, but because their personal circumstances would not determine whether or not they could, could um, 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 participate. That's not what's before us here, this rule here. But um, 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 I, I just think um, Senator Druskowski is um, respectfully is just very wrong. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I'll be brief. And Senator Ress, we had fantastic women candidates on the Republican side no, that were do. defeated by white men. So uh, <laughs> just, just letting you know, we tried. Um, Madam Chair, I, I, I agree with Senator Dreskowski in, in that um, we have to have a bias towards uh, participation. I, I agree that Senator Pappas that you know when we had remote voting in, in 2020, we lost a lot of our collegiality as as a body. And I think in some ways we're looking at these rules as as a methodology of, of getting that back. I can remember twice in the in the 1718 biennium where we were at a 33-33 standstill because. We had two health conditions where members were hospitalized and, and unable to participate. I think it's also important to remember that participation is not just casting a vote. We are a deliberative body, and there is not a way for members remotely to fully participate in, in, on the floor. Thank you. Sometimes my little hamster falls asleep on the wheel. Um, a member can't be part of that debate. They can listen, but they can't engage. Um, and so it's, um, it's something where uh, I think we have to be very, I, I agree with Senator Rust, I voted for the, uh, and Senator Dibble, I voted for the, the committee piece because we have that ability to have that full engagement. But when we're on the floor, and I think, as, as Senator Dreskowski mentioned, compelling someone to be that 34th vote. Without the 
protections, the assurances that it's truly the member voting and not just some sort of proxy vote. I know it's been, mm -hmm. proxy voting has been a practice of the House for, for decades, but has, has not been permitted in the Senate. And uh, as Senator Rust and I talked yesterday, I think there's mutual distrust over, over the proxy voting uh, that we have today. And so when I think of members being counted as far as division, members casting votes, we, um, if we are going to allow for remote voting, we have to be very, very careful that we take the steps necessary to ensure that it is the member who is engaged, who is listening to the proceedings, um, who knows what they're voting for versus just um, casting a vote because a member's not in their seat. Um, you know, we've seen on occasions where uh, a remote vote has been cast uh, incorrectly, and and we need to we need to find ways. I appreciate Senator Rust and Senator Ruskowski um, setting up the meeting with um, with Mr. Murphy in the House to. Uh, to go through that, and I'm very hopeful that we can put some uh, some guardrails around this before the end of session. Senator Dibble. Well, going back to my uh, house training, like I did the other day, uh, <laughs> that's all been said, but not everyone has said it. <laughs> no thought goes unexpressed. I just wanted to reinforce some of the points that were made. One, uh, I'm just thinking about yesterday in the transportation bill, um, had to work through some sticky issues, <laughs> which would not have been possible um, without the people present that I needed to scoot around to and have little small sidebar conversations. And uh, we worked out those sticky issues pretty well. Would not have been possible if you know, several of those people had been remote. I mean, I suppose it would have been possible with texting and phoning, but it would have been a lot harder <clears throat> um, to do. Um, and, uh, and so that just illustrates the the benefit of being present. And so completely agree with everything everyone has said about uh, making it way more preferential for folks to be present, allowing that space for people to be absent when they need to be. And I think that's a positive development. Going back to my original point, and thank you for supporting me on that point, uh, Senator Skowski, just leaving it up to the inclinations of one individual um, and so that there may be a vast difference between the caucuses, I think, is, is not desirable. So all of that is a long way to saying I'm going to commit to taking this work back and, and speaking with everyone and seeing if we can't figure out something. Don't know if we get it done this year or not. I hope we do. Um, but it's definitely something we need to grapple with. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Are there further amendments? Senator Jaskowski. Are the A5, Madam Chair? The A5 uh, deals with per diems. Um, I think I might have mentioned at the last meeting that just this last summer I was confronted with the need to respond to an email about whether or not I wanted to be given a per diem for uh, participation in a committee meeting that I participated in remotely during the interim. So during the interim means we're not in session. Uh, per diems, Madam Chair, uh, members traditionally have been, um, the meaning of that has been to reimburse expenses while you are at your uh, commitment to work. Um, and to distill it down more, it, usually has met paying for meals, um, largely mm -hmm. meals and sometimes lodging. Um, and so I saw this and I realized, okay, so I am participating remotely. Um, potentially, I, 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 Senator Rust and I were debating this yesterday too. <laughs> but, um, potentially on a, a laptop paid for by the Senate, by the taxpayers, um, using internet access paid for and reimbursed through the Senate. Um, lunch was in the fridge and I was in my house. So I was trying to think about or legitimize or rationalize in my mind 
what would my legitimate expenses be for participating that day? And I couldn't find one, Madam Chair. I couldn't find a single expense uh, for me to participate remotely as a member of that committee during the interim. And so I understood at the time anyway that, that this was the first, that this was a policy shift within the Senate. And so I am bringing this forward, uh, Madam Chair members, to suggest that our, our policy should be that during the interim, if you are participating remotely as a committee member, that you should not be getting per diem for that. Because again, Madam Chair, I, I can't think of, I mean, as a, uh, I mean, you could make the argument that, that during the, um, during the session anyway, you are, you know, you, you're required to at least be participating uh, and remote's your only way to do it, and it's part of your official duties. Uh, but I can't see any reason that there is a, an expense associated with this that should, again, encourage us. I mean, if we're paying people to participate remotely, during the interim, in a committee, we are encouraging more of it. I mean, if, you're, if we're not paying them, we're gonna discourage that, um, or uh, maybe not discourage it, but at least not encourage it. And this amendment addresses that, and I ask for your support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Certainly, members can always refuse per diem, or not apply for per diem during the interim which is the, the, the approach that you do, because uh, we do that a lot for our bonding tours. But um, I think since we're, as long as we're a part-time legislature, people, a lot of people, a lot of members, maybe not everyone, have uh, outside employment. And so in order to participate in a committee meeting, even if it's a remote committee meeting for several hours, they have to take the time off their other employment. So in a sense, it's a, it's a way to help compensate them for that time they're taking off. So I would not support this. As I said, you know, Senator Draskowski, you're free if you don't think you should get the per diem to just not, not apply for it during the interim. Senator Rust. Well, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm two minds on this. Um, the, um, I, um, I tend to um, agree with the first sentence on committee hearings, but not, but then on the second sentence, um, First of all, I don't know why the word policies is in um, is in uh, is capitalized unless it was it's supposed to be referring to the policy handbook of um, of the Senate, um, and I don't know that that is covered there. Um, but then I mentioned um, earlier that the Senate does not control. And I know this is kind of get, trying to get around that. The Senate does not control um, uh, legislative uh, uh, rules of participation in legislative uh, commissions. The uh, Legislative Coordinating Commission controls that. And um, to the extent that um, if you're going to have a meeting, uh, one person has to be here in person and um, <clears throat> has to be at the Capitol in person. We've certainly encountered that in the Legislative um, um, Commission on, on, on tax expenditures. Even if it's only myself, who's the current chair, um, sitting down in room 15 with a couple of staff people, that meeting um, uh, cannot be held unless it is, um, unless at least one member is, um, is present and then um, uh, people either take per diem or or they um, or they um, or they or they don't. And I I'm not um, I guess I'm kind of uh, torn torn by it um, beca because what if you a, a circumstance where um, you come to the Capitol, but you can't be at a, um, you're here at the Capitol, but the committee is being held in St. Louis Park. And so um, 
you're here, but can you uh, participate remotely and get and get per diem where otherwise you're working through the day or attending other meetings that are in the building, in this building or in the MSB. Uh, I think it is a, um, uh, uh, I think it, I think this amendment is just way too um, inflexible, although it, it has merit, if that makes sense any sense. Thank you, Senator Rust. So further discussion? Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I think Senator Draskowski brings up an interesting point. Um, we are salaried. Our compensation is decided by a, 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 a third party commission. Um, and the role of per diem is, is intended to cover our expenses. It's not, meant, it's not meant to be uh, a, a, a salary uh, addition. Supplement. Uh, supplement, thank you. And um, so when I, when I drive here from Prior Lake, I've got the expense of, of driving up and, and filling my tank and grabbing lunch and, and everything else that, that goes along with it, that as Senator Kowski said, if he's at home with internet that's paid for by the, by the Senate on a, on a computer that's provided by the Senate, it's, it's hard to find where those expenses are. Senator Rush, you bring up an interesting point though also, um, when I think of the legislative task force on metropolitan governments, the, the, the reform task force we had where we held Two, uh, we held four remote meetings. We had somebody here at the Capitol uh, at all times, but the majority of the members were either in uh, Minneapolis, Lake Elmo, uh, St. Paul, or, or Shakopee. Um, and there was expense for those, there was expense for me to drive up to Lake Elmo. There was expense for uh, members to, to drive from St. Paul, Minneapolis down to Shakopee, and we appreciated their, their participation. So, um, Conceptually, I'm, I'm going to support the, uh, the Dreskowski Amendment if it goes to a vote, but I, I also think that there's maybe some work that we can do around it to ensure that we've uh, got that participation and, and we really are not su uh, supplementing someone's income, but we are actually recognizing it per diem as, as it's in its initial int um, intent of being uh, that for covering expenses. Thank you. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, not necessarily to the, to the um, amendment itself per se, but um, I do want to call attention to the issue or the question that Senator Pratt raises <clears throat> and just remind us that um, we, we might have the opportunity to differentiate between different times of the year and different manners uh, and purposes under which we receive per diem. Um, and I'll just remind everyone that, you know, we're, we are salaried and not in control of our salary. That's the purview now by virtue of the constitution of the, of the salary commission who has communicated very clearly to us that if we were to modify our per diem system or get rid of per diem, um, the, the salary increase would probably compensate for that. They've communicated that to us. I think every year they consider our salary, <clears throat> or every, I don't know, it's every other year. Um, so we might want to open up this conversation about per diem um, and, you know, whether or not we want to continue it in the current form that we have. I mean, maybe during the interim is one thing, but during session is another, um, or under this circumstance or that circumstance. Um, you know, of course, we have housing reimbursement, those sorts of things, which we would need to consider in that conversation as well. So I just wanted to make note of that opportunity we might have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Dibble, you beat me to it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it, the, the, uh, the Compensation Commission and that constitutional piece um, explicitly states that they're the only, that's the only place that the compensation is supposed to happen. So in, if members believe that 
this per diem is not reimbursement of expenses and that it's compensation. And we are finding deliberate ways to expand the use of it that on its face is unconstitutional. And so you've got that part of it. And then my testimony earlier that, you know what? You don't have any expenses when you're, when you're operating remote on the computer. Anyway, so something to think about. At this point, Madam Chair, I'll withdraw the amendment, but um, I, think, I think we need to do something about this. We need, to, we need to stop the proliferation of per diem. I've had bills in the past to get rid of per diem. Maybe Senator Dibble and I will have another Dibble Draskowski approach here, but um, I think that would probably be in the best interest of the institution in the long term, given where the where the boundary markers are now. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll withdraw the amendment. Thank you, Senator Draskowski. Are there other amendments? Uh, before we um, move. Uh, adoption. I do want to uh, turn to uh, uh, Ms. Stangle to talk about the effective date, the issue of an effective date, and get your guidance on that. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, there, as you can see, there is no effective date in the resolution, um, so it would be good to have some guidance for what that would be. Um, there would clearly be no retroactive. So if, if this were to make it all the way through the process and off the Senate floor without anybody giving any direction on when it would become effective, I think the, the advice I would give it would, would be that it would be, all of it would become effective the day after the final vote on the floor. That's not a good process. Um, it would be good that part of the motion along the way would be or direction from somebody is given with specificity on when this should go into effect, um, particularly if there was a desire to have any or all of it, the per diem be retroactively effective, that would need to be very specifically made as part of a motion. Um, so if the desire is to have any piece of it made effective retroactively, that should be built into the motion. Um, if the desire is to have it effective the day following it's not really enacted, so the day after it was finally approved by the Senate, uh, I think that desire could be sort of stated on the record and incorporated, you know, when, it, when it's made to the Senate floor. So um, it's sort of up to the subcommittee if that wants to be, if you would like that built in today or if that's a conversation for further, so a decision for further conversation. But I think it's still an open question. Senator Dibble. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Dangle. Uh, Mr. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Dibble, um, both, I think. Um, all of the rules need to be effective at some point, and I think to Senator Pappas's earlier question is, should the change to per diem be effective at some other point? On, should it be retroactively effective, I think is the, is the question. So you could pull out that piece and make it um, effective some other time, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have the other things be retroactively effective. Senator Dibble. Um, so I don't have an opinion on the per diem piece, that's complicated. Um, uh, but on the rules, I'm curious to know um, what others think about the effective date. Uh, I mean, it does, it does strike me as fairly simple. Senator Rust. Thank you. Um, I, um, I don't exactly know um, where I think a, a per diem issue should be uh, decided, but um, why should it just be the beginning of, uh, um, of this session? Um, these rules were um, promulgated 
uh, last last session, and if they if they <clears throat> are inadequate with regard to per diem, if we're striking that, which I support, uh, which was last year's, um, why not go back uh, in all fairness, and anyone that was um, uh, that was voting remotely uh, last year uh, under the rules there, uh, why not? Um, uh, give them the per diem that they had to forego by voting um, uh, voting uh, remotely in the uh, 2023 um, legislative session. I don't see uh, I don't see any difference um, uh, in terms of well, it would just be sent for this session. Well, why not for both sessions? Uh, why not for the bi biennium with regard to um, uh, remote uh, voting. There were any number of people for any number of different legitimate reasons that voted remotely last um, uh, last uh, last session, um, just as there are uh, this session. And I I would be very uh, reluctant to say this session is um, is a better place to make that retroactive than than not than last session. I'm just uncomfortable with that. I'm equally uncomfortable with, um, uh, with as you mentioned, Senator Dibble, with uh, starting it like right now. I mean, the, somehow that doesn't, that doesn't work very well either <laughs> uh, or doesn't seem to be um, particularly uh, fair either. And I don't, I don't know where the sweet spot of it is, but I, I don't think it's just the beginning of this session, certainly. Senator Dibble. Uh, thanks. Well, you know, I'll go with whatever Senator Ress has like an opinion on the retroactivity on the deal. I was talking about you know, all the math. I see. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Um, I'm just going to do a friendly reminder, if you can remember to turn on your mic, if you haven't been turning on your mic. Um, for me, at least, uh, the question of per diem and retroactivity feels like, uh, like a question we should spend a little more time on and not try and make a decision about that here. And since there has been a fair amount of comedy expressed among the members uh, to grapple with some of these questions between now and the next rules hearing, I would suggest that we take advantage of that and advantage of the help that we might get from our nonpartisan staff and the secretary's office, et cetera, on that question and then come back uh, and answer it when we get to the rules committee. I, I could also see us doing the same on the implementation of the rules, so the effective date on the rules in general, although for me, um, I am, I don't know that we're making substantive changes so much that we couldn't put them into order and into action once they've been adopted by the body, um, which would be, uh, you know, if we stay on the schedule we're on in a couple of weeks. But I, you know, I appreciate also that the idea of changing the way we operate um, at this point in the session could throw people. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, I see Senator Jaskowski has a question. I'll turn to him before we reach a conclusion on this. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I concur. I, I think, uh, not with everything, but I concur <laughs> with the, I, I think, I mean, most of the major changes, structural changes are just conforming to practice anyway, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the Committee of the Whole and, and that process is, there's really not a substantive change there. Um, maybe a few days for members to read the rules and understand them after they're passed might make sense in terms of rules. In terms of per diem, I, I just want to make it clear because I haven't spoken up on this, but there's certainly very strong opposition to removing that provision uh, that's in there. 
Um, I do believe that uh, if you don't have any expenses attached to that event, uh, that per diem is is a um, under the carpet uh, backdoor approach to a salary um, adjustment, and I, I think that's I think it's got the same constitutional questions. Um, so um, certainly expect uh, more challenges that down the road. Thanks. Other questions or comments on? or motions on effective date at this point. Are you ready for a motion? I am, Senator Rust. If there's one to be made, I'm ready. Um, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair, I, I move that the uh, document SR029-16 as amended be um, recommended to pass and referred to the full rules committee. Does everybody understand the motion? Okay, Senator Rest has moved that SR 029-16 be recommended passed, be recommended to pass and be referred to the full committee on rules. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those opposed? Aye. Thank you, Senator Kunish. And those opposed, please say no. And that motion is adopted. Thank you, Senator Rest. There's one more piece of business yes. um, before us. Um, and in our packet, there's a CR009. This is a committee resolution. Um, I would like us to take this up knowing that uh, it, you know, the, the conclusion may change after there's been a field trip to the House. But this is a resolution that would be giving the Secretary of the Senate uh, the ability to pursue a remote voting system that offers security and identification features. Um, essentially, we would be asking the secretary to develop the means um, and bring a recommendation back to the Rules Committee on how we can vote remotely and securely um, and dispensing with then the, the method that we're using now. Um, and as I understand it, as they have done this in the other body, um, that it did take some time uh, for that uh, mechanism to be developed. And if Secretary Bowdern, if you have anything you want to add with regard to this resolution, you're welcome to join us. Um, if people have questions about this, um, now would be the time. But I think it would be better for us to, to, to move the resolution so we're giving direction to the Secretary on this topic, knowing that um, the, the work that is being done between now and the Rules Committee um, could shape this a little further. Secretary Bowdern. Madam Chair and members, um, I'll certainly take any questions you have and just want to emphasize, uh, despite the way the language may appear, uh, my understanding would be this would be a very consultative process and I would intend to remain in dialogue with the members who are interested in this throughout the process of developing options. Are there questions for the Secretary? Sec Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. and. And I think this is a, a, a good resolution to pass. I, I think we do have to have a permanent secure uh, solution that may require technology investments along the way. I am still concerned, though, with us not doing something yet this session that, that may be temporary um, and, and kind of... Uh, for going the good for the perfect. Um, so I, I want to have this discussion for a long-term solution, but I don't want to lose fact that there are opportunities for us to take uh, uh, procedural steps yet this session in order to uh, ensure the, the, the uh, authenticity of, of votes being made. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Seeing no other discussion, Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a reminder, 1030 next Tuesday in the House chamber somewhere. So anybody who's interested can join us, please. Thank you. So, Senator Rest. Um, so I do, um, are you waiting for a motion on the resolution? I am. Then I move that the committee adopt um, CR 
009. Senator Ress moves the committee resolution 009. Uh, be passed. Be passed. Be recommended to pass and then and referred, referred to, to the, the committee rules on rules. Committee. Mm -hmm. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those opposed say no. And that motion is adopted. And with no further business before the subcommittee, uh, I want to thank you all very much for the work you've done thus far and the work you're going to continue to do on this effort. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned.